is presented by Truly Hard Seltzer. Please drink responsibly. Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Lilbon, Tony. My Cubs collapsed, I told you. Didn't make the playoffs. I'm Tony Kornheiser, that stinks. How'd the Bears do? Worse. Better? Worse, really. You know, mm. the Cubs were a year early, maybe. Yeah. They should have gotten in. They had a 90% chance, according to fan graphs or any of that dumb stuff. But the Bears, you know, I sat there for a half an hour after the game. I was there. I couldn't move. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I just sat in an empty soldier field angry, and now I'm getting angry yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, that's a real healthy way to go through life. Welcome to BTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, the Bears blow it, USC escapes Colorado, and James Harden no-shows media day. But we begin today with the NFL. The Buffalo Bills decisively beat the Miami Dolphins yesterday 48-20, to and the San Francisco 49ers, behind four touchdowns from Christian McCaffrey, beat the Arizona Cardinals 35-16. to Well, Bonnie, after yesterday, do you make the Bills and the 49ers the best teams in each conference through week four? Well, the 49ers, yes, Tony, because as you know, Philadelphia struggled with the Washington team, needed yes. overtime to win that game, and really could have lost, maybe should have lost that game. The 49ers, but I'm going to say this, the 49ers, people will just look at the results, and say, that is the Cardinals. The Cardinals are competitive. The Cardinals are tougher than people think. And I thought the Cardinals played pretty well yesterday. And, you know, the 49ers just, you know, put the smack down on them. Listen, when you have a coaching staff that knows how to use McCaffrey, I mean, McCaffrey was not a special, he was a nice player early in his career. He's special now in that system, in that offense, with the way they know how to use him. And defensively, yeah. the 49ers could be the best. I look, Philadelphia may, you know, bump back up there. I'm not so sure about Buffalo. I don't know that I want to make Buffalo, yeah. like, that big a favorite over Kansas City now, even though Kansas City struggled with the Jets. The Jets' defense actually showed up yesterday and did what was promised all season by all the alleged pundits. I'll narrowly go with Buffalo, and I will say yes to the 49ers. Yeah. So I want to point out, and it's important to note, this is after week four. It's a quarter of the season. Right. Football coaches, as you know, Mike, divide the season into quarters. And the team that is the best in the first quarter does not automatically become the best in the fourth quarter. Let's take the Tampa Bay Rays in baseball as an example. They were torrid out of the gate. But then Baltimore caught them and passed them. And Tampa's in the playoffs, but they're in the playoffs as a wild card. Having used those words of caution, I do think these are the two best teams at the moment. Uh, let me just say they are legitimate Super Bowl aspirants, as are Kansas City, as are Philadelphia, and maybe as complete outsiders, let's just say Dallas and Detroit or something like that. And at the moment, Mike, I've got San Francisco ahead of Buffalo. Yep. This kid, Brock Purdy, the last pick in the draft, he was 20 of 21 yesterday. Um, no picks, a touchdown, 283 yards. He's 9-0 and as a starter. He's 12-0 and when he finishes. And the last pick in the draft, Buffalo. We may look back at the end of the season, Mike, and say that the Jets beating Buffalo on the first Monday night game was the total outlier of the season. The Buffalo's killing people now. Their last three games, they, they've won 123 points to 33. It's plus 90 in three games. And they held... Miami to 20. Miami had 70 the week before. Miami was averaging 43. I would just say that these are not surprise teams. They were in the playoffs no, last year. No, no, Buffalo, that, Buffalo you know, is going to They're not Buffalo. surprises. They're doing what they're supposed That's to do. That's right. That initial That's week right. loss appears to have woke, awoken yeah. them, and good for them. Surprise teams, Houston and Tampa Houston. Bay. You Houston go, what? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, what? Yeah. Let's so. move to the notable losers from yesterday. The aforementioned Bears had a 21-point lead over the Broncos late in the third before collapsing, falling to 0-4. The Bengals are now 1-3 after getting blown out by the Titans, and the Patriots pulled Mac Jones, Belichick did, in a 38-3 yeah. trouncing by the Cowboys, the most lopsided loss of Belichick's career. Tony, of the three, which was the worst? Okay, so the worst loss is the Bengals. They're not competitive against Tennessee. It's the worst loss, Mike, because they're the only team of the three that was a legitimate Super Bowl-aspiring team. The other two are obviously not. And they had a quarterback who most of us thought was the next great quarterback in Joe Burrow. He got hurt. He's not 100%. He can't run. It's going to inform the entire season. The statistics, Mike, are terrible. He has 728 yards on 150 pass attempts. That's 4.8 
per attempt. That's 34th among quarterbacks. It's, it's awful. The Bears aren't the worst loss because the Bears stink. But the worst decision by a coach maybe ever, you'll go over this. I'm sure they're tied 28-28. Yeah. They're on the Broncos' 18-yard line with 2.57 to go. Left in the game, fourth and one, and he goes. What? You have to kick the go-ahead field goal. You have to do that. And if you don't do that, and it's your 14th loss in a row, people could be saying goodbye. But I'll make yeah. this part of it brief. My heart goes out to the Patriots as honestly the worst loss, Mike, because they really have a good coach. And their quarterback isn't dragging his calf around. You know, and, and, and they don't stink. And right now, they're in the ooze. They're in the ooze. Yeah, I mean, the Patriots, the Patriots losing, it, I, I, they, I just, maybe there's Patriots fatigue because they were so great for so long. I just dismiss, okay. I, get them out of here. I'm going to dismiss the Bengals too, Tony, because Joe Burrow's hurt. He's hurt. There we, and then the season may be lost, Tone, but he's injured. So there's an asterisk. There. That's right. Justin That's right. Fields is not injured. And by the way, you, you marveled over Purdy going 20 for 21. I think Justin Fields was 23 for 24, including a team record 16 oh, right. for 16 to start the game. All right? He was, yeah, he was on just bad at the end. Fire. He yeah, made he was great, great at the beginning. But Tony, yeah. you know what? Yeah. It shows you the difference between San Francisco and the coaching Purdy's getting and the coaching that Fields is not getting. I know Fields had the strip fumble. That was a bad coaching call. Worse than yep. not kicking the field goal was the fourth and one play, Tony, where they try to draw him off sides, then they call a timeout. They're indecisive. Look, I say this. It's tough for me to say this. I don't normally do this over my career, 40-plus years doing this. If I woke up this morning and I ran or owned, owned, not ran, the Chicago Bears, I would have fired that coach and Luke Getze, yeah. his general manager, out. Because, Tony, what I'm looking at is there are players out there. DJ Moore is a hell of a receiver. They got back. The line is not what it should be, and that may be the GM Ryan Pohl's fault. But they're wasting, they're wasting Justin Fields. And now there's a lookout for Caleb Williams. It doesn't matter who your quarterback is and how great he was in college if your coaching staff is inadequate. The Bears coaches this morning should have been asked to clear their offices. We move now to the NBA, where the disgruntled James Harden did not show up at the 76ers media day, but that was predictable. The bigger NBA story is Boston trading away Malcolm Brogdon, Robert Williams III, and two number one picks down the road for Drew Holiday, who didn't even have to unpack in Portland. Will bonded the Celtics, just bypassed the Bucks by landing Holiday. No, no, Tony, because the Celtics were sort of committed in terms of off-season preparation, just before camp preparation, coaching preparation, to a large lineup with Rob Williams. I know he gets hurt a lot. So does Porzingis, the guy they got. Rob Williams probably actually plays more than Porzingis. But they were looking at how to play large. And I think what they did was something that was corrective in that, to me, it was really dumb to get rid of Marcus Smart, the heart and soul of your team, a guy who can lead, who can make plays, who can challenge teammates defensively, ball handling, late in games, muscle, sheer muscle. It was dumb to get rid of him. And now they went and got Drew Holiday, which actually addresses some of what you lost in Marcus yeah. Smart. Yeah. So I'll applaud that. And I applaud the Celtics for trying to get better because they've been close but not there. But I don't know that they passed Milwaukee. And Tony, I, I don't know about Milwaukee because they too have to replace what Drew Holiday did, and that's not what Dame does. That's not why yeah. Dame is famous. That's not why Dame has got $60 million or more in the last year of a contract. Dame is one of the great scorers any time in the NBA, but he doesn't do what Drew Holiday did specifically. So I don't know about either one of them. I don't. I got questions. I, I, it's impressive. Yeah. It's fun to talk about. I got questions. We've talked about this off air, and we differ a little bit on the edges. I don't really care who you send away. I care about who you get back. And who the Celtics got back was Marcus Smart, but better. Because Holiday's better than Marcus Smart, and he's a fantastic defender. I don't care about the draft picks down the road if they're number 28, 29, or 30 because you won a championship. I don't care about that. So what, what essentially happened was this. Malcolm Brogdon, the Celtics didn't want him anymore, and he didn't really want to be there anymore. So they essentially traded Robert Williams III for a great league guard in Drew Holiday. Robert Williams hardly ever plays. So I think 30 teams out of 30 would make that trade. The question now becomes... 
is Porzingis any good? And as you say, can he get on the court yeah. any more than Robert Williams? Because right. neither of them actually, they don't actually get on the court. But I will, I'm totally confident in this, Mike, that both those teams are way ahead right now of Miami and Philadelphia. Yeah, yes. Way yes. ahead. I mean, Damian yes. Lillard is a drop-dead clutch scorer. And Drew Holiday on that team is going to be like a great, great lead guard. Like a great fit. Tony, I mean, just real, real quickly, I, I, listen, okay. I agree with your bottom line on these situations. I, get, I got a little bit more in the way of questions than you may have. But if you're Philadelphia, Philadelphia is on the clock. If you're Joel Embiid and you're watching this play out with Harden, where he's not in camp and they haven't traded him, and I don't know how much leverage he has. Perk had a great line saying Harden's leverage was he doesn't care. And when you don't care, you're a dangerous character. And and Perk he's is dangerous. so right he's, about he's, that, he's Tony. He's a festering if, if you're sore, in and they have to move oh, him quickly. Oh, my goodness. Quickly. Yes, they do. Let's take a break. Coming up, Colorado gave USC a game, but was that the most compelling college result of the weekend? And what lessons should Team USA take from its Ryder Cup loss? Like, I don't want to get in the weeds. The season hasn't started, and I don't care about it now. I care about baseball playoffs and football, but you've got to get rid of James Hart. Yes. No, you have to. You have to. Can't have him around. Can't win yeah. with him. Pardon the, inter to pardon the interruption. Presented by Truly Hard Seltzer. Part of Happy Hour. Trying to find out what's moving the masses in mail time. I'm going to get the first mail one, time. Mike. Here we go. Which college football result did you find most compelling? Tone, I, I, I didn't find, unlike last weekend, where there were a slew of games that were compelling, I, I, I didn't find that many this week compelling. I just didn't. The, the one, only one game stuck out to me, and that was the, I texted you, the Colorado UC, uh, USC game. And again, when, yeah. the, when, the, when the sitting Heisman Trophy winner, and there's only been two, one time has the guy won twice, the Heisman. When Caleb Williams goes out there and throws six touchdowns, and Colorado comes back and makes it close, and I was at a game, I was at Northwestern Penn State, so I just see the score, and I'm going, what? Caleb yeah. Williams makes a compelling tone. He does. I'm biased. I love him. I want to see him win again, but he makes it compelling. All right. So from a perspective of the national championship, the most significant score was LSU losing to Mississippi. That's two losses. They're out of the playoffs now. From a sort of what's going on here standpoint, it was Georgia having to come back against Auburn. Yeah. Georgia's living on the edge. Yeah, they are. Georgia was down in the second half to South Carolina and down also Lost votes to Auburn. Because of it From too. it's a savior season perspective, yeah. Clemson going into Syracuse and winning comfortably and Notre Dame going to Duke and finally winning. But if it's from I'm sitting in the couch and I'm not getting up till this game is over. Right. It's USC yes, in Colorado. Yes, of course it is. And if there is such a thing as a moral victory, Colorado had it. Because, Mike, at one point in that game, the cumulative score in the last two weeks with USC and Oregon was 90 to 27 yeah. against Colorado. Yeah. That comeback was a big deal. Thank you for keeping me up to date because yes. your text woke me well, up. I was, I was like, whoa, what, what we got going on here? What lessons should Team USA take from its loss at the Ryder Cup? I, the usual lesson, Tony, for all of our sports nationally, if we don't do as well as we think we should, which is less arrogance, less. And mine goes to before. I, I'm not going to get into the Joe LaCava. I, 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 I just, I'm okay with all that. It's the Ryder Cup. They're supposed to be angry at each other, point, scream, wave your hat. I don't care about that. Nine of the 12 people on the United States roster did not play a competitive round of golf after the Tour Championship. All 12 of the European players played competitive golf after that. They were ready. We were not. We didn't take it yeah. as seriously as they do. Oh, wait. We got basketball coming, though. Oh, well, maybe not. Yeah, okay. So lesson number one is... Try to practice alternate shot. We lost 7-1 to one in alternate shot. Yeah. And at one point, Brooks Kepter and Scotty Scheffler lost 9-7. and seven. They had that between them a 41 <laughs> on the front. Amazing. A 41, Mike. That's ridiculous. Lesson number two is pick better captain's picks. Kepka, Spieth, Thomas, 
Sam Burns, Con Morikawa, Ricky Fowler, they stunk the joint out. They were 4-12-4 and four overall. Nobody won more than one match, and Spieth and Fowler didn't win any. And lesson number three, Mike, is get a charismatic player leader like Rory McIlroy. Go out and offer him United States citizenship today, because that actually He's matters. We don't, right? like that. we, we don't have yes, anybody we like that. We don't have anybody like that. Yes, we do. His we name don't. is Eldrick Woods. You think he can't oh, be the yeah. next uh, captain at least? Okay. Yes, make Go him the captain him. then. Beg him. Email. Go get him. Let's take one last break. You won't have to beg him. He'll do it. Still to come, the baseball playoffs are set. As are the WNBA finals. Less arrogance, Tone. And Zach well, Johnson. Eh, eh. Yeah, he, it didn't it didn't work. Eh. It just Luke it Donald did on not the other hand. Work. Northwestern zone. Impressive. Luke Donald worked. Luke yeah. Don- Coming up on Monday Night Countdown, getting you... Pardon the interruption is presented by Truly Hard Seltzer. Please drink responsibly. Part of happy hour. Happy time, people. Happy 78th birthday yesterday, Rod Carew. We marveled at Ichiro's career the other day. Ichiro finished with a career average of 311. Carew, 328. Woo! The Hall of Famer was an 18-time All-Star for the Twins and the Angels. He won seven batting titles, posting a 388 average in 1977, which helped win him the AL MVP. But Carew never won a postseason series. The Twins are in the playoffs this year, despite their record-breaking 1,608 team strikeouts, a tendency that irks Carew. He told the Minneapolis Star Tribune earlier this summer that his contact-based all-fields approach to hitting doesn't count anymore in modern baseball. It doesn't count, Tony, and it's sad. It's one of the many reasons why baseball, and it's great Theo Epstein's trying to get activity like this back in the game, but baseball's not as good. It's not as entertaining as it was when Rod Carew was there. And I loved when Harry Carey would, for some reason, say he'd walk into a bar and just like to say to everybody there, my name is Rod Carew. I don't know what that meant, but it sounded cool when I was a kid. Uh, you've told me that for years and years. It always makes me smile. Happy anniversaries to Sandy Koufax and Bob Gibson. On this day 60 years ago, Koufax struck out a World Series record 15 Yankees in a Game 1 win. The Dodgers would go on to sweep that series. Five years later, again on October 2nd, Bob Gibson broke Koufax's record when he struck out 17 Tigers in a matchup that pitted him against Denny McClain, who'd won 31 games that season. The Cards won that game but the Tigers won the series in seven because of Mickey Lolich. What did I just say? Do people think that seeing three or four relievers each team is as good, as entertaining, as compelling as seeing Koufax and Gibson? No, baseball's not as good. Get angry. Yes, I'm an old man. Get off my lawn. Get off the diamond. Koufax, Gibson. Let's see more of that. Yeah, that's magic. A melancholy trails to Tim Wakefield. The knuckleballer died over the weekend reportedly of brain cancer at the age of 57. Wakefield was drafted by the Pirates as a first baseman, but he converted to pitcher after mastering a knuckleball that his father taught him as a kid. Wakefield went on to win 200 games, 186 of them for the Red Sox. He spent 17 of his 19 seasons in Boston, and he was part of two World Series winners, including the team that broke the curse. No pitcher has ever started more games or thrown more innings for that franchise And only Carl Yastrzemski, Ted Williams, and Dwight Evans played for them longer. And Tony, when you're on a list at the top of the list after Cy Young and Roger Clemens for that franchise, talk about somebody whose career probably wasn't appreciated enough. And when I heard some of these things yesterday, I just went, wow. I mean, we watched Tim Wakefield his whole career and did not realize and not appreciate him being that good. And sadly, another melancholy trails to Russ Francis, another Boston legend. The former tight end died in a plane accident at the age of 70. Francis made three Pro Bowls for the Patriots in the 70s before abruptly retiring before the 1981 season amid a dispute with the team. Bill Walsh talked him out of retirement a year later, and he won a Super Bowl with the Niners in 1984 before finishing his career back in New England. Tony, he played in the shadow of some great tight ends like Kellen Winslow, and Ozzie Newsome, and but he was a terrific player himself, not in the Hall of Fame, and I know people can come down either side of those things, but a, a player of impact, and obviously if Bill Walsh wants you late, he must see some value yeah. even then. 
Mike, I know you're moved by this as I am, that you lose, if you are from that area, the New England area, and you lose Tim Wakefield, in, in and the you same lose day. Russ Francis, wow. and you had this bad weekend where the Patriots were not competitive, and this is actually the day that Bucky Dent's home run beat the Red Sox. And I can imagine there's a gloom about this. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, they get past it in the middle of the no, week, but there's a loss gloom of life. in Boston yeah. and New England, right? There's a gloom Absolutely. today. We are running out of show when we go to the big finish. Let's do Real it. Real Mac, your boy. Yeah. He had six sacks against yeah. the Raiders. I'll bet you're impressed. Oh, yeah, we got rid of him because he couldn't get to the quarterback anymore. Wonder how many times we sacked Russell Wilson yesterday. I don't remember any. The Vikings beat the Panthers for the first win of the season. There's significant. Well, I mean, they beat a terrible team. The Panthers are terrible. But let me put it the other way. Had they lost to the Panthers and gone 0 and 4, yeah. that would be more significant because it would be the end for the Vikings, as we've understood them for a few years now. The Liberty and the Aces advance to the WNBA Finals. I'll bet you're excited. I'm excited. I'd be really excited if the series could actually start and end before November. <laughs> Somehow the schedule maker decided it was okay to wait until like yeah. next Sunday to start the series. Sorry, that's awful. The Mets fired Buck Showalter. Deserved? Uh, I don't know if it's deserved. It's reasonable. He was the victim of unwise spending. Last one, four wild card series start tomorrow. Which one excites you the most? Tony, Texas, Tampa Bay, Toronto, Minnesota, Miami, Philly. Nope, I don't care about those. Diamondbacks at Milwaukee. That's what I'm going to keep my eye on. Following your own division, we are out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. Brandon Mack, plumber extraordinaire, thank you. Shout out. I'm Mike Wilbon. We are bumped to the deuce the next two days, knuckleheads. Now to get you set for Monday Night Football, here's Scott Van Pelt and the Countdown Crew. Can we shout at him? Can we go, Scott Soul, what's up? Can we do that? Are we allowed to do that today? Just did. There we go.